Allah of our friends. I would have loved to have the podium on the same level as my friends here so that I can be closer to you. Also, I wish we had just a little bit more light so that I can see your faces. Is this possible? Not the full beaming light, but just something so that I can... Yes, fine. Yeah. I think they are not putting all the lights in order to help with the uh, temperature. But I think that will be fine because when I see your faces, I can speak with all my heart. And this is all I plan to do tonight. I really have not prepared a speech. I have come in response to an invitation of your National Spiritual Assembly. I have come from the Holy Land, the heart of the planet, the spiritual heart, the administrative heart of our planet for the Baha'is. And I bring you all the love of the world center. As I talk to you tonight, to me you are a cross-section of the Canadian Baha'i community. You belong to a country whose rulers have been addressed in the Kitab Aqdas by Baha'u'llah himself and called upon by him to bind the broken and to crush the oppressor. You belong to a country whose soil has been blessed by the footsteps of the beloved master. A community whose members are partners with the United States Baha'i community, partners in the reception of the tablets of the divine plan, co-heirs of those tablets, those immortal tablets. You belong to a community and a country about whom Abdul Baha wrote that he saw a bright future, a great future, a glorious, he says, future, both spiritually and materially for Canada. Your National Spiritual Assembly I believe was the first in the entire Baha'i world whose constitution was accepted by the parliament of the country. Your community has moreover produced distinguished hands of the cause and great servants of this wonderful faith. And a martyr who, although she did not shed her blood, but was ranked as a martyr by the beloved guardian. 
a community that can pride itself in having produced for the beloved guardian his consort his one and beloved consort that he called his shield and protector your community has further produced the celebrated and illustrious architect for the superstructure of the shrine of the bar and the architect for the mother temple of the west your community through your national spiritual assembly has been res responsible in being not only among the first but i can say with confidence the first national spiritual assembly in the entire bahai world who during this period of persecution in iran succeeded in forging such close and cordial ties with the authorities in this country that enabled many of the persecuted and downtrodden bahais of iran to find refuge in this country furthermore i don't know of any other national community in the world that can pride itself in having three international agencies serving the entire bahai world one for the bahai studies the other for health project the health agency that has been established here and the third for development projects although they are at the beginning of their operation but they definitely hold great promise for the future these are the distinctions of your community and from Uh, the uh, vantage point if you like in haifa those of us who are privileged to be there and serve there we see these wonderful things in this country and in this community we should all be grateful to bahaula that he has bestowed such blessings upon you all may we all be deserving of these precious and wonderful blessings the question that i have been asked so many times during this trip and of course the pilgrims ask the same question the question is how long will the sufferings of iran have to continue you know there is a prayer written by the beloved guardian over 50 years ago that i know the my persian friends here most of them would probably know it by heart rabbana wa malazana azal qurubana in this prayer shogi effendi asks two questions one is is there any refuge any haven for us save thee addressing bahaula and the second question is how long 
Will this injustice, will this oppression continue? How long shall we endure this tyranny? To the first question he gives his answer in the prayer itself. He immediately says, Nay, nay, we have no refuge save thee. To the second question, he gives no answer. This is locked up in the knowledge of God's knowledge, divine mysteries. We cannot know. All we know is that we have to be forbearing, we have to be patient, we have to be confident that He is watching over us. He is watching over the Persian Baha'i community. He knows, He sees, he has given us the promise, the guarantee of the victory of his faith in his native land. We have to be patient. The trouble is that our patience is just a little bit less than his. In another letter written about in, in a letter from Shoghi Effendi written about the same time as that prayer I refer to he gives us an indication of how things will be with the Persian friends he says that I am using my own words not quoting he says that the darker the horizon, the fiercer, the onslaught, the more the friends are encircled from all six sides, from every direction, the sooner will that day come. And therefore he calls on the Persian friends not to be perturbed, to stand firm, to trust in him so that these final stages may also pass by and the promised triumph may appear on the horizon. But when you think, when we think of what has happened in Iran during the past four years, you will immediately agree that the Baha'is in Iran, the community in Iran, has been purified has been unified has truly made great advances in spirituality in detachment in dedication this is the condition of the friends in Iran today I believe that every one of them should the test come should that hour of test come to them I believe they will stand firm with their lives in their hands hopeful that they too would win that crown of martyrdom in his love.
as to the Baha'is outside Iran, you know better than anybody else what has been achieved through the blood of the martyrs, through the sufferings, the sighs of the oppressed. In one of his tablets, Baha'u'llah says that from every drop of blood shed in his path, God will raise up thousands of souls, countless souls, to support his faith. I was in South Carolina and there was a Baha'i who had just come from Honduras and she said that during the last two weeks they have had 5,200 new Baha'is in Honduras alone and she was a witness. Shoghi Effendi, in his writings, wanted that the National Assemblies of the world would forge such close ties with the media that the faith would be proclaimed everywhere, far and wide. This has been achieved, friends thanks to the sufferings of the friends in Iran. He wanted the faith to be explained in favorable terms to those in authority in the free world. Thanks to the blood of the martyrs, the doors were opened and representatives of national assemblies have been able to effectively present the faith with emphasis on the right teachings, the true aims and purposes of the faith to government officials everywhere in the free world, also in the third world. He wanted, Shoghi Effendi also wanted the faith to be given and explained to the intellectuals, the leaders of thought, what he called the erudite. This too was achieved, maybe to a lesser extent, but great strides have been taken and it is hoped that greater and more glorious steps will be taken in the future. So you see, we have reaped a very rich harvest outside Iran. But as the faith is becoming more known and better known in various quarters of the world if you read the writings carefully you will see that there is bound to be more opposition on a wider scale everywhere in the world that the opposition will not be confined to Shia Islam in Iran. It will spread to other denominations within Islam. And then, as Abdul Baha has clearly stated, throughout America, he says, Europe, Africa. He refers to the strongholds of Hinduism, 
of Buddhism and then as if to sum it all up and to make sure he has not left anybody else he says all the peoples and kindreds of the earth one and all he says will arise to attack the faith the faith of Baha'u'llah Shoghi Effendi confirming what Abdul Baha has said has told us that peoples nations religions will successively arise to oppose the faith we may be surprised that in a free world like North America how could we have opposition of course we will we have had it already uh, I just referred to North Carolina to South Carolina already there the churches in the villages in South Carolina are telling these poor black Baha'is many of them illiterate they don't know where Iran is exactly maybe they say see they are killing you if you come back to the church however no one can touch you Shoghi Effendi speaks about intellectual tests that will surround the Baha'is of the West he speaks about those who will arise to sap and destroy the unity of the Baha'is those who will misrepresent the aims and purposes of the faith those who would like to see the faith uprooted root and branch such a day is ahead of us such a contest is ahead of us I don't, I don't tell you this to frighten you I tell you this so that we might be realistic in our deepening work in our consolidation work in our study of the writings so that we might be prepared for the days to come in God passes by in the last chapter prospect and retrospect he speaks about the process of crisis and victory that go hand in hand when we have opposition following it of course we have a crisis of some kind but this crisis leads to victory the victory in turn incites the enemies of the faith to attack us in another time this time again such attacks will lead to a further triumph for the faith so this is the pattern of Baha'i history it has been so and it will continue to be so until that promise of Baha'u'llah would be redeemed about the universal recognition of his faith and the universal triumph of his faith when Shoghi Effendi speaks about this opposition he visualizes he actually refers to the rising forces of nationalism of racialism of materialism of secularism 
in another letter referring to secularism he calls it haughty intellectualism and finally to the forces of ecclesiasticism that we now see in Iran and we will continue to see everywhere else because in most cases the opposition will be generated however quietly by the strongholds of religious orthodoxy and religious bigotry such is the picture that Shoghi Effendi has drawn has painted for us not only in the West but throughout the world and as I said earlier on we have no choice but to prepare ourselves for that day and what we see today happening outside Iran is not at all that great tempest that great storm that he has forecast there are little winds very much like the rain we had this afternoon that's all not the real storms those are yet ahead <clears throat> now in order to prepare ourselves we go back to our own personal lives each one of us personally individually because without this individual effort nothing can happen Shoghi Effendi says even the concourse on high are powerless to help if the individual does not arise it is the individual in the last analysis that really counts he is Shoghi Effendi says the brick on which the strength of the entire edifice depends the stability of the entire edifice depends and how can we achieve this we can achieve this through our daily efforts in teaching the faith in having reliance upon the promises of Baha'u'llah who tells us in no uncertain terms that if we arise then we will see with our own eyes how Baha'u'llah will fulfill his promise we have to be sure that he will fulfill his promise our faith can be either like someone standing far from where the fire is burning and seeing a smoke and saying where there is smoke there must be fire and then signing the declaration card this is maybe one form of faith but is it enough surely not what we should do is to fortify our faith our individually our belief in Baha'u'llah this should be strengthened fortified it can be fortified through study of the writings through exposure of our souls to the holy word the creative word through teaching the faith through sacrifice either by through contributions to the fund or through our daily efforts 
through a self-assessment, a self-examination of where am I? Where am I going? What is this life all about? This realization of where we are, this is absolutely essential so that faith can be transmuted, changed, developed into certitude. Otherwise, faith alone will wobble when the test comes. It needs to be strengthened and uh, fortified. It should be protected. Shoghi Effendi says it should be protected, fortified, and exemplified. He uses three verbs regarding our faith like a flame which is in our hearts not down there in the valley somewhere or up the mountain with some smoke rising in the sky no a flame within us a flame which is which generates heat a heat that you can feel a heat that you can transmit that kind of faith that you carry with you you have to protect it you put a glass around it you protect your flame but that's not enough you have to increase that flame and then to allow it to reflect itself exemplify itself in all our deeds all our actions all our words this will touch the hearts otherwise there will be nothing but empty words and the world is full of words the world actually is tired of words When Shoghi Effendi speaks about the leaders of thought and the erudite, what do you think such people, when they learn about the faith, will do? Would they not want to know what influence has, has the words of Baha'u'llah, have the words of Baha'u'llah had on our lives, individually and collectively? Wouldn't any intelligent seeker want to do that? Wouldn't he want to know whether that blueprint on the shelf, however beautiful it is, however unique it is, wouldn't he want to know what we've done with that blueprint? Whether we have built something, and if so, where is it? And what is it? Does it agree with the original? Or is it something different that we may have wanted to build or possibly improve upon the original? This is what they want to see. You see what grave responsibility lies on the individual and the individual friends the individual it is not his job to look at his neighbor to see what his neighbor has done if he has arisen he will arise if he hasn't he might think well why should I do it he hasn't done it our responsibility is to God Baha'u'llah in the Tablet of Wisdom says, Regard not the children of God and their deeds and doings. Fix your gaze on God's never-ending sovereignty. 
In another tablet, Baha'u'llah says that those souls who are steadfast, those souls who are the true believers, will consider themselves to be the sole helpers of the cause. Each of them will so think. It means that I should not think that there is another Baha'i anywhere in the world. This should not give me a sense of pride. God forbid, I hope it won't. But what Baha'u'llah is saying is not to make our deeds conditional upon the deeds of others or their lack of deeds. We should think we are alone. We should think we are Mullah Hussein. Imagine Mullah Hussein as he left that room in the house of the Baab. And has, as he walked the streets of Shiraz, he was alone the Bab in his house in that upper room and he alone facing the entire world such should be our faith not to make it conditional upon anything upon anybody but to realize are the preciousness of our sacred tie to Baha'u'llah and to try to live in accordance with what would be his good pleasure because without his good pleasure whatever the service we render in whatever, whatever form it is, has no value at all. Because service has a form. It also has a spirit, just like we have a body and a soul. Service has a form and has a spirit. My understanding, friends, of the writings is that the form is of no value. What counts is the spirit. There may be nine chairs in Haifa and I may be sitting on one of them. But if I am not serving Baha'u'llah in that spirit that would win his good pleasure, that chair is of no use to me or to anybody. That chair becomes my test. It becomes my calamity. That chair could be not in Haifa, it could be in Toronto. It could be in any of these localities, anywhere in the world. The chair is only important as an instrument, maybe, that through that chair, through that position, through that function, we might be given another opportunity to serve him. But even if we have no chair, we can serve him. The spirit counts. Now, there is a prayer in the prayer book revealed by Baha'u'llah on the occasion of no ruse.
in this prayer now I'm putting it in my own words I'm not quoting because my head is like a sieve I can't remember anything these days forgive me but I'll give you the essence of it and then you check with the exact words of the blessed beauty and I want to explain it this is why I'm using this type of language he envisages two souls in that tablet one who has fasted all the 19 days because you know no ruse comes at the end of the fasting period so he's commenting about the fast one who has comment uh, who has fasted all the 19 days but for some reason it's not acceptable in his sight his motive was not pure whatever Baha'u'llah says that in the sight of God in the presence of the Almighty such a person has not fasted although the poor man fasted and got up every morning and so on and so forth he has not fasted not only that he has committed every iniquity in the eyes of God then he envisages another so who has not fasted but he has that purity of motive that goodly radiant heart that detachment I don't know that thing which has won him the good pleasure of his Lord in the eyes of God he says that man has indeed fasted all the 19 days and not only that but he has performed every goodly deed from eternity to eternity and then he goes on to say that every deed depends upon his acceptance so it is not the form it is not how active I appear to be how much I run about how many files I have at home how many committee member uh, co committees I am on or assemblies I am on or any of these things none of these things count you know there is a little story of uh, you may have heard this uh, of a man who was in uh, Arabia and uh, he was having his long obligatory prayer next to a path where the tourists normally would pass so he chose that special spot to have his obligatory prayer there and so as he was praying and the tourists were passing by and they looked at this man and the heat of the sun and the desert and the sand and performing this wonderful prayer they said to themselves oh, how wonderful what great adoration what great worship and devotion our worshipper heard this and he liked it and so he stopped his prayer and he turned to the tourists and he said and you don't know I'm also fasting <laughs> now if God forbid we serve the cause instead of for the sake of God 
we serve the cause for the sake of man we have wasted our lives this life that has been given to us we don't know its duration no one knows to some may be given 80 years or more to others less to still others very much less as i am speaking to you tonight i might drop dead right here now doesn't bahaullah say that death shall come to thee unheralded unheralded unannounced who knows how can i afford how can we ever afford to postpone this service to some other time and then carry on with our lives exactly as we have been doing and go god forbid to the next world not as we should go not as much as we would like to go with our hands not quite so full and perhaps rather empty this is the point i think that if we as individual bahais come to realize who we are we are not believers only in the bahai faith if you read the writings you will see that he expects us to be lovers not only believers indeed he expects us to be intoxicated lovers in the faith there is always a minimum and a maximum uh, the minimum is just passable is this what we really want to do with our lives the rock bottom minimum when he stands there and he invites us to scale loftier heights to reach the summits to reach his good pleasure that's what he wants us to be he produces abdul baha he tells us follow him that is the standard his teachings are the standard it is to the maximum that he is inviting us not to the minimum the minimum is if someone would accept bahaullah let us say after having seen the smoke and that's it he is not required absolutely to contribute to the fund for example no one is going to come to his house to check if he has performed his obligatory prayers or whether he has fasted or whether he is studying the faith no one is going to take him to task individually because he is not teaching okay he he lives his life and then one day he dies now the bahais get together and have a prayer and bury him now that is this the sort of life we want to live bahais yes surely not what he wants is something else 
Why did he bring his cause? Why did he himself suffer? Why does he pride himself over the martyrs and heroes of Iran? Why does he have all those exhortations in his writings? You can go on naming them, but that is the purpose of our lives. We should plod on, confident that if we arise to serve his cause, he will assist us. He has told us over and over again, in the teaching work, for example. He, someone uh, wrote Shoghi Effendi about wanting to teach and wanting to pray about the teaching work. Pray, he says, that Baha'u'llah may send you receptive souls. Because he will send them. This is a promise. He will send them. But who will he send them to? If the door of my heart is closed and locked up, if the door of my home is closed and locked up, if I really have no time for Baha'u'llah in my life, do you think that Baha'u'llah, do you think that Baha'u'llah will send his waiting souls to me in this condition as I am? Surely not. He will want to see who is ready to receive such a guest because they are children of God who are seeking him. He will send them to those who are ready to receive them, who long to receive them, who supplicate and implore him that he send such souls to him. He will send them to such souls. So, this is the thing to do, to arise, to put our trust in him, because he will send us his waiting souls. And it will be very easy to attract such souls to the cause, to convert them, to help them to accept the station of Baha'u'llah. It will be very easy. This is our duty, friends. Shoghi Effendi speaking about the, the, the hosts of the kingdom. He says, let the doubter arise and ascertain for himself the truth of Baha'u'llah's promise. In other words, Shoghi Effendi even accepts the doubting Thomas. He doesn't tell him, get away from here. Why are you doubting? He says, come my boy, come my girl. All right. As Abdul Baha says, it's not man's right to test God, for it is God's right and privilege to test man. But nevertheless, Okay, you doubt. All I tell you is, arise. And if you're not convinced, you will be convinced that the hosts of the kingdom will rush forth to aid you, to assist you, to confirm you, to inspire you in what you should do and what you should say when talking about your love for Baha'u'llah to that contact. We belong, friends, to a religion 
God's religion for man today. We don't belong to a club. This is a living, pulsating religion. We should have trust. We should have confidence in the words of Baha'u'llah. And we should carry on with our work with full confidence that not only will he redeem this promise but he will redeem all his promises. Yes, the opposition will come. And as it is coming from this society around us, that society will continue to disintegrate. While these processes are going on, you see the faith of God advancing. You see it gaining strength and going from strength to strength, expanding, consolidating its roots, thrusting out its branches, not only in one country or one continent, but believe me, everywhere. Until, as Shoghi Effendi says, through a mysterious operation of his will, suddenly, he says, suddenly, he uses the word suddenly, And possibly through or after the calamities which are ahead, the convulsions and commotions which are yet ahead, there will be, he says, a sudden in thousandfold increase in the numerical strength of the Baha'i community. This he wrote not in reply to a question. He wrote this because he was impelled by whatever divine forces impelled him to write. Over his own signature for Baha'is and non-Baha'is to read. And with confidence he says there will be the sudden at its appointed time the sudden thousandfold increase in the numerical strength of the Baha'i community. And he goes on to say in that same letter that there will also be a corresponding increase in the material power and the spiritual authority of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Why did he have to write these things if he was not sure, if he did not see almost with his visible, his physical eye what was ahead? He wrote these so that we wavering human mortals will be assured that the victory is guaranteed by him that all we have to do is to arise. We can delay the victories but we can also speed them up But the victories will come. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to listen to more content on the Oneness Movement, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment. See you next time.